I'm Vitor Rohta and I'm supervised by Professor Alessandro Milhão. And the title of this presentation is Interpreting Deep Neural Networks Through Knowledge Extraction and Graph Analysis. So this is a research that is inside the topic of explainable AI. And this is a very important topic, especially nowadays, and especially because deep learning is being applied on real and important applications like in healthcare and the medical domain, in robotics, speech recognition, and things related to computer vision and language processing. But despite the success uh, of deep learning methods in all of those fields, there is a no problem, which is the lack of interpretability and transparency in the decision-making process of those, this approach. And the problem is that the high complexity of deep learning models makes it very difficult to understand the decision-making process or how the model is reaching its final decision. And this is, this is a problem, especially because in some domains like in, in medical domain and law enforcement, for example, it's not sufficient to know only the final prediction of the model or how good the model is, is under certain metric, but it's important to know the whole decision-making process in a transparent manner. And the way deep learning is nowadays, this is very difficult to achieve. So if you look in this convolutional neural network that we have in this slide, so a network like this can have millions of parameters and millions of calculations happening in the, in the hidden layers of these models. And it's impossible for humans to look at those parameters and interpret it. And also there are different types of layers and different types of applications. So some models are designed for images, some models are designed for text, and all this uh, brings a challenge to coming up with an explainability model for models like this. And this especially leads to some uh, key challenges on the field of deep learning. And the first is that it is difficult to understand and fix even minor mistakes in the model. So, for example, when you detect that the model made a misprediction, it's difficult to understand why that happened and when we can expect that mistake to happen again. And even if we manage to understand it, it's difficult to go there and, and fix the mistake to guarantee that the model will not behave like this again, because it would involve uh, updating those parameters that we don't understand what they are. Second, it's, it's difficult to identify possible biases and weaknesses within the model. And here, I mean that it's difficult to guarantee that the model is fair from a human point of view or free of discrimination, for example. And third, uh, understanding structural properties of the model is not trivial. So what, do, what are the roles of a specific neurons or specific layers in the model? Uh, how, how does the target classes relate to each other? So these are some questions that we need to be able to answer in order to have uh, more transparency in the decision making. And of course, we need this if you want to guarantee that our models meet the guidelines for trust of AI that requires AI models to be lawful, ethical, and robust. And to guarantee that we can meet these requirements, we need to have more control over the, the, the models and more transparency in the decision-making process. So given this, we need to say that this is a topic that is being addressed since the 90s. And there are different approaches that tries to add some level of transparency to deep learning models. And the first approach is try to measure the contribution of each input to the output of the DNN. So this is, uh, this is a good contribution because it shows how, how the model behaves under different changes in the input and in, with different features. But most of this, these methods, they are limited in terms of the architecture. So many of them tackle only the input layer and not the, hid and not, not the hidden representations. And even though the ones that tries to, to do the same for the hidden representations, they don't consider in different types of layers. Most of them work only for fully connected layers and not for convolutional, for example. The second approach is to build traditional machine learning that performs almost like the DNN, but that are uh, more interpretable. So for example, one strategy here is to try to extract rules and build decision trees that behaves like the DNN that you want to explain. And we know that the, the decision tree will have a certain level of interpretability that is good. However, it suffers from the same limitations from the previous one because most of these methods rely only on the output layer of the model. So it, it, they, they don't explain the hidden representation. And the ones that can do this only are limited to fully connected layers as well. 
And third, we have visualization techniques that play a, a very important role in this field of explainability. So for example, visualization techniques can generate uh, insightful things on how the model behaves under, under certain inputs. And we can generate heat maps and salience maps to see where the model is paying attention, which is good. We can try to understand a bit how the layers of CNNs and how some filters respond to certain data inputs. But usually they require uh, a lot of human intervention. We need a human perspective to, to go there and interpret the visualization itself. And usually they, they are designed for explaining how the model behaves for a single input, for input, a specific input target, and not to understand how the model works as a whole. So the object of this research is that given a pre-trained neural network, regardless of the architecture of the application, our goal is to extract and represent the knowledge hidden in the representation in order to better understand the decision-making process. Now, to do this, we are proposing a graph-based approach. And for this, we are inspired in some recent studies in neuroscience. So in neuroscience, they are using what they call functional graphs to study the structure of the brain. And in this concept of functional graphs, they don't tackle the physical uh, activities in, in the brain. They are only looking at the functional activities. So how, those, how the neurons in the brain are firing together and activating together. So what they do is to build a graph where the nodes are correspond to the neurons in the brain and relationships uh, connect the neurons through statistical correlations in the way based on the way they activate together. And we, we think that if they can get, give insights from how the brain works, we can do similar things for how the neural networks work, because the brain is much more complex than the neural networks we have nowadays. And that, that there is a question, so what's the motivation behind using graphs for this? So for both neuroscience and for our purpose. So graphs have been used in different complex systems and they have proven to give a rich analysis on how those complex systems work. And some examples are big social networks and biology systems and protein interactions. So the brain structure and many, many other complex systems. And this happened because there are consistent methods to extract relevant insights from graphs. So we have algorithms for detecting communities. We, can, we know how to identify important objects through node centrality analysis. And it's easy to retrieve information through graphs uh, by using uh, the, the query mechanism on graphs. And the third point is that graph representations are suitable for being combined with different sources of knowledge. So if we look in the data sets we have nowadays for deep learning, some of them are connected with some type of uh, knowledge source. For example, the image net is, is connected with the word net hierarchy. And we want a, a, a method that can make use of this knowledge as well. So the, to do this, we draw uh, two hypotheses for this work. And the first is that the knowledge containing the deep neural network can be captured by extracting and representing statistical dependencies on neural activities. And the second is that given a graph representing statistical dependencies among neural activities, graph theory methods can be used to give insightful interpretation on how the represented DNN works. And we began the research by addressing the first hypothesis and more specifically this first research questions. So how can we extract and represent statistical dependencies among neural activities, which is basically how can we build a graph uh, based on these statistical correlations? And this leads to the first contribution to our work, which is the idea of co-activation graph. So first thing is, what is a co-activation graph? It is a graph representation that connects every pair of neurons in the DNN based on a statistical correlation of the activation values. So it is a graph where the nodes represent neurons in the DNN and the weighted edges represent statistical relationships between the activation values. And the first thing I'm going to do is to show how to build this co-activation graph. And then we show how, how, what's the purpose of using it. So this is basically the, the pipeline on how to build a co-activation graph. So imagine that we have that uh, neural network with three hidden layers. The first thing we will do is to input some data to the network, for example, a bunch of images. 
when we input this image to the network, the neurons will start to output some activation values and we collect the list of activation values for each of those neurons. So we have a list, for example, for neuron zero, neuron one, and every neuron in this network. With a list of activation for each neuron, we can calculate the correlation between them and build a correlation matrix. And this correlation matrix is all we need to build a co-activation graph, which is the last image in this slide, which in principle is a fully connected graph where the, neuro, the nodes are the neurons and the relationships are the statistical correlation between them. Now, the question is what do we want to achieve with this graph? And to explain this, I, I put this image so I step back, we have the neural network, we build the co-activation graph, which is a fully connected graph, but some of the, actually many of these correlations will be very close to zero, so we can cut them off by applying a, a threshold. And this will bring us to the third image, which is a more analyzable graph. And hopefully, if we apply some graph analysis in this co-activation graph after applying the threshold, we will have some insightful interpretations on how the DNN works. And for example, we expect to find some groups of neurons that are constantly being activated together and together with some classes. We want to, we expect to achieve some nodes that are more central than others, maybe points to more important node neurons, some paths and so on. Now, yeah, I put here this, this pipeline just for, for reference, but the important thing here is that th this is just the, the procedure step-by-step -step that are in the previous slides. But the important thing is that this formal definition that's that is present in the report and the step-by-step -step procedure is a start a first uh, initial answer to the research question one. So we provided a way to build this graph. And as the next step, we in this research question, we are planning to provide a consistent way to define this threshold and different methods for extracting activation values for different uh, layers specifically. Today it works for fully connected layers and convolutional layers, but we might have other types of layers. So after this, after proposing this graph, we began to do some experiments and we used three data sets here so far. So we had uh, the MNIST handwritten, MNIST fashion and the CIFAR 10. For the MNIST data sets, we trained a model from scratch. And for CIFAR 10, we use a demo Bionet V2, which is a state-of-the-art deep learning model with 19 hidden layers. And to begin with the experiment, so we trained the models and followed that step-by-step -step procedure to build a co-activation graph for each of these data sets. And then we started with our other research questions. So the first thing we want to, to check is, is if, if the knowledge in the co-activation graph is compatible with the knowledge in the DNN itself. And then the question is how well can functional graphs based on the statistical dependencies among neural activities represent the knowledge acquired by DNNs and how can we measure this suitability? So the first thing we did here to understand what the co-activation graph means was to try to plot some visualization. And in this visualization, we are seeing a co-activation graph for the MNIS handwritten data set. And we can see that uh, we have neurons in blue and neurons in, in yellow. So those neurons in yellow, they are just the neurons in the output layer. We can identify them and because they mean the output classes of the model, we can uh, put some label in them. So this, the five, seven, nine means the neurons in the output layer corresponding to the classes five, seven, and nine in the, the data set. Now we can see from this image that we have uh, many neurons that are correlated to each other, many neurons that are correlated with the output classes, and also many classes that shares a lot of neurons. For example, the class one, three, and four, or the five, seven, and nine. So these are the things we explored in the beginning. And the first thing I tried to do was to understand what does it mean that a, a node is highly correlated with an output class in a co-activation graph. So to check this, we selected the most k-correlated neurons to a specific class. So pick, for example, class number seven, we, we collected the neurons most correlated to them in the co-activation graph, and we activated those neurons in the DNN, expecting that in this example, the class seven would be predicted. And we checked if the respective class was predicted. So we show that for k equal to seven, so by picking the seven most correlated neurons to a class, 
For the fashion data set, we always get the expected class as the predicted one. And for the hand, handwritten digit, we get it 80% of the times. Uh, and this shows that we can look at the coactivation graph and see what are the neurons that are responsible for improving the prediction value of each class in the model, which is the first indication that the knowledge is, is compatible between the two. And then we did the, an analysis on the number of shared neurons between two classes. So we call this the overlapping analysis. And we analyzed how the number of overlaps in the coactivation graph affect the mistakes in the DNN. And what we are showing here is that there is a posit positive correlation in say that if two classes share a high number of neurons in the coactivation graph, then there are a lot of mistakes between these two classes in the, in the DNN. And th this shows again that we can look to the coactivation graph and understand something about the DNN. And it also gives a hint on the origin of those mistakes, because we know which neurons are shared by those two classes. So probably there's a mistake in, in these neurons, although it is requires further evaluation. But these two analyses first show that we can query the, the coactivation graph to find the neurons with a high impact over the prediction values for each class. And we can find a strong correlation between class similarity in coactivation graph and pairwise mistakes in the DNN. And we, we want as next step for this research question to perform this on different models, different applications and data sets to validate it. Now that we have this intuition that the knowledge encoded in the coactivation graph is, is compatible with the knowledge in the DNN, the question is how can we use it to, to something useful? So the research question three is how can we use graph analysis to interpret the origin of mistakes in the deep models? So if, if some mistakes are uh, occurring in the model, we want to understand what's the origin of these mistakes. And to do this, we use the community detection algorithm in the coactivation graph. And we perform this community detection analysis and we use the Louvain algorithm, which detects a group of classes and neurons that are similar from the point of view of the DNA. So an interesting result here, if you look at this table, the, the first thing we notice is that there is a semantic similarity between communities C1, C2, and C3. So in C3, we have all the vehicles in the data set, and in C1 and C2, we have only animals. So this gives an intuition that the model not only learned how to distinguish between the 10 classes, but the model somehow knows what is a vehicle and what is not a vehicle. And this, this becomes even more interesting if we increase the resolution parameter of this algorithm. So the resolution parameter, we can increase it to detect less communities, but bigger ones. And if you do this, the C1 and C2 gets merged in the previous table. And we have a perfect separation here between classes that are animals and classes that are vehicles. And so, so it's interesting to, to see the semantic similarity and it shows that it is important to detect groups of neurons that predict similar classes, because we can look in these communities and extract what are the hidden neurons inside these communities. So what are the neurons responsible for the animals and the ones responsible for the vehicles? So this is uh, the, the beginning of our answer for, for research question three. There are still many things we want to try here. And the first thing we want to try is that we need to investigate more and evaluate more if the neurons in the community are responsible for, for the network errors between the classes in that community. We want to evaluate if it's possible to relate the neurons in a community with specific features of the classes that are in that community as well. And to combine knowledge from external sources to improve the semantic analysis over the detect, detected communities, which might be useful to enrich our explanations as well. So the last research question we, we asked was, how can we use graph analysis to understand also weaknesses and biases in the deep learning models? And to do this, we used the concept of centrality analysis, node centrality in graphs. And we studied how node centrality can be used to detect important neurons in the DNA. So we did the, the following procedure. Imagine that we can call a neuron that, uh, we can say that a neuron is important in the DNA. If, if we remove the neuron from the DNA, we suffer from a drop in the accuracy. So we first calculated the node centrality in the coactivation graph. We pick at the node with highest centrality and lowest then. 
and we removed the respective neuron from the DNN and from the co-activation graph to check the accuracy loss. So this was to see if no, central nodes can point to important neurons. And the result is interesting. If we look in the second column of this table, we are looking for pruning by page rank. And when we remove nodes with high page rank and co-activation graphs from the DNN, which is the blue line, we have a high accuracy loss even in the beginning of the pruning process. So we can pick very central nodes and this will make the accuracy in, in, the, in the DNN go to almost zero. If we do the opposite and pick the lowest page rank, we can remove a lot of neurons and the accuracy will remain stable. So th this shows that the page rank is very informative in the sense that we can go there, look what are the central nodes, and those are probably important neurons in the DNN. Now, if you look in the, the, the pruning by degree centrality, the same doesn't occur because if we prune by higher degree in the, in the CIFAR 10 data set, that there's one behavior, so high, higher degree is not important because the accuracy remains stable, but in their handwritten, it's difficult to separate higher degree from lower degree, and in the fashion, the opposite behaviors, uh, behavior occurs. So higher degree is important and lower degree is not important. And so this shows that for this experiment, the degree centrality is not very informative, but uh, I think we still need to repeat it for more data sets, but it gives an idea that page rank can be very, very useful to detect important neurons in DNNs. So as next step for this, we want to investigate the role of the central nodes. So why some nodes are more central than others? And how do we use this information to detect bias in the DNNs? And one idea that we have to, to start doing this is to apply visualization tools to understand why some nodes are more important than others, to see how some of the central nodes respond to specific inputs and so on, and understand why also some centralities are more informative than others. Why page rank is consistent and degree centrality is not. And some non limitations of our method so far. So the first is that our method is a bit biased on the threshold choice. So the, all these analysis, they will be a bit sensitive on how we pick the threshold. And also the current strategy for extracting activation from CNNs relies on the spatial average pooling. This is because a filter in a CNN doesn't output only a, one, a single activation values. So we need to apply this spatial average pooling on it. This might result in information loss. We don't know how significant it will be, but we want to test other approaches to overcome this. And in summary, we showed that uh, co-activation graphs can be built for different architectures and applications, although we haven't showed different applications in, in these presentations. I applied this for NLP models in my internship in Noca Bell Labs, and it's working well. The detection of communities in Co-activation graphs can review groups of classes that are more similar from the point of the DNN. And some central nodes that indicate important neurons in hidden layers. So all of this showing that the knowledge in the co-activation graph is compatible with the DNN and we can explore it to, to understand more on how the model works. So an overview on the next steps. For the research question two, we want to validate the approach for more complex data sets and different applications. We started working on this in the internship and the, the experiments in NLP, I got the best presentation award, which was a, a very big thing for me. And we are also conducting experiments on the medical domain. We are planning this for the upcoming months. For the third research question, we are investigating more the role of neurons in the community. So why that neurons are in that specific communities and what's the relation with the, the mistakes between the classes in that communities. We also want to combine the knowledge from external source with our approach. So this is challenging, but we are we have a collaboration with Amsterdam Data Science and we are studying different approaches to do this and how our method can benefit from this specifically. And for the last research question, we want to investigate the role of central nodes, why they are more important, why some centralities are more informative than others, and how can you use this to, to detect bias in DNNs. So uh, a timeline on, on how we are prioritizing these tasks and how we plan to, to do this and some publication targets. And 
I, I've achieved a few publications and awards during this process so far. So we first published the idea of co-activation graphs in the DEXA conference. And we have this uh, journal paper that's waiting for a final decision where we, we contain the, the community detection analysis on C410 and the centrality analysis. I'll be presenting the, the co-activation graph in the doctoral consortium at the KR conference in September. And the best presentation award from Nokia Bell Labs with the NLP experiments. And just some references I used for the presentation. And thank you very much if you have some questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Fitur. Uh, what we're going to do now is ask the, uh, if there's anybody from outside who is not a, um, an examiner or from the public to ask any questions they may want to ask now. Andrew, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, Suzanne, yes. Hi, Vito. Great, great talk, as usual. Um, very interesting work. Yeah. Um, I was just curious with the the communities. So you worked with MNIST and 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 C4, and the semantic um, relationships, the semantic concepts in those are pretty pretty simple. Have you any thoughts about what might happen if you had the um, the hardware and the processing capacity to try this on something like say ImageNet, and connect it to something semantically rich like WordNet? Would that um, would that help the, the underlying questions that you're looking at, or is that just too complicated to, to really work with this approach? Okay, okay, Suzanne, thank you. Uh, so actually we have ongoing experiments on this, so I can briefly tell a bit of the results we have on ImageNet. So on ImageNet, the data set I have, they have 100 classes, but 20% are dogs. Okay, and what happens is that the dogs fall all in the same community. If you, if you look at, if you do the same analysis. So I'm still working on it. Uh, I'm anticipating some results, but the, the things that, it seems that the model really knows how to distinguish between dogs, which is a good thing. But if you look at other, other communities, the, the semantic might be slightly difficult to, to understand. However, what we are finding is also that the mistake is happening inside the communities every time for every data set. So our communities are showing the classes that are more similar from the point of view of the DNN and the DNN makes a lot of mistakes within some communities. So what I think here is that if the model learned the data set in a semantic way, we can detect it. But it, it, it depends on what the model learned. That, that's my guess so far, but something we are exploring now. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep, thank you. Okay, have any more questions? I'm gonna count down from five, my usual thing. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay, Susanna, you're gonna come in again. I just saw you there. <laughs> okay. So um, I would now like to ask the uh, public to leave and, uh, and to say well done, Vitor, on that. And, uh, and thank you very much, everybody.